So the question I wanted to raise this morning is, is there a pedophile gene, meaning people born with this, with this kind of uh, tendency? Or, and I, I don't, I don't think any of us want to think that there could be a pedophile gene. That, that's like, we can't do anything about it if the gene is there, but. The pedophile, especially some of these serial pedophiles, are proved to be extremely hard to dent. But in all the literature I've read, and in all, it's that there always turns up, usually in the pedophile history, that this pedophile has been molested himself. He's when he was a child, or at some point, probably for a prolonged length of time, and then other factors can enter into it, into his back history. And, but at any rate, everybody agrees that some of these pedophiles are extremely hard to treat, uh, to have any hope that they're going to change. So we've resorted to uh, uh, having them register as sex offenders, uh, so people can be aware that they're dangerous people <laughs> in the large. So, I don't really know, but I, I think the whole question is worth going into. And I looked at uh, the idea of there being a pedophile gene. Uh, I looked at uh, that somewhat as I looked at the idea of the gay gene. Uh, because I think that, uh, I, for, I've only known about two people that I thought it was very obvious that Mother Nature had endowed them with physical characteristics, everything that would predispose them to, like for example, the girl was big, broad-shouldered, deep voice. Mother Nature? Yeah, Mother Nature was at work here. What if Nature's here. not a mother? And, <laughs> well, sometimes <laughs> Mother Nature's cruel. And then the boy was light his voice was like light, feminine sounding. Uh, it was just like Mother Nature had given him too much and her, her not enough to make them what their sex was, clearly. And I thought, and oh, these two suffered. I mean, you know, in high school, you can imagine. And, and I thought, oh, Mother Nature was cruel in this case. So, and then there was one girl, it was perfectly normal. And so I thought, so that was to me, and of course there could be all kinds of variations that you were born with. And I would say predisposition or tendency uh, that would place you, well, that would lead possibly to uh, work or some kind of life you would lead that you would, like, for example, uh, I knew another guy who had come uh, in my past who had come out as gay. And he said that he, that he remembered feeling, having feelings for gay, uh, for men or boys, when he was as little as three years old. And, uh, but I knew his background very well, and so I would keep looking into it to see if, I felt that his background had probably, and his life experiences had probably helped him to feel more for <sighs> boys than for girls. For example, his mother was heavily focused on him. I, I felt that almost immediately she transferred all her feelings to the boy from the husband. She was not too fond of the husband, you know, she sort of looked at him like, oh, poor old George, but she was just fascinated with this child. And also she sort of made him into a girl, her companion. Uh, she taught him to sew <laughs> and uh, cook and didn't seem to be aware of that she might be. Now, with these, with these minor things, you know, to him, I'm sure that these were minor considerations uh, 
because he was buying the idea of the gay gene completely. And, but I, I say in the example of the pedophile gene, uh, we don't want to think pedophile, <laughs> they're born, not made, uh, because that almost negates everything that we could possibly do to change them. And so that we'd stop trying to see if we can change people. When are we going to start on the booze gene? The booze gene? Oh, oh, oh. uh-huh, yeah, a booze gene. Oh, an alcoholic gene. <laughs> How do you like my shirt? What? Do you consider that you, you like were born shirt? with an oh, oh, yeah, this is the booze shirt. Do you and think who that you were this born? shirt for me? I did because you, if anybody has a booze gene, it's probably you, right? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's some families that seem uh, predisposed to alcoholism. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to sort of center on this idea of the, the pedophile gene. If we just settle, if we were to just settle on that and label every pedophile that came along, well, he was born with it, and now what? What? Put him in a cage and uh, try to protect the public? No, we just keep on, I think that would, we wouldn't keep on studying what happened to this guy, look into his past. We wouldn't, and parents wouldn't be trying to protect their children. Uh, it's like, I almost, and, and you know, when I felt that the gay gene started to become so important, it was like almost all talk stopped in the press of things that parents might be able to do to uh, kit, keep their kids from getting into homosexual activity. You know, before this, and also when the American Medical Association declared that homosexuality was, uh, uh, that you were born, so therefore there was this idea that you could be cured or this had happened to you because of this, that, and the other, you're bad parody, you're this, you're that. But, I, I don't think it's a good thing for this to stop all, all examination of what people do that might affect. Uh, and I think that this right now infuriates gays to think that we might think, but I think as parents, you don't, I know, I know when the, when my boys were growing up, well, there was this pedophile, this young pedophile, who was trying to involve all the teenagers, and he didn't seem to, in some kind of sexual activity, almost like he was a, somebody they could go to if their girlfriends, you know, their little uh, religious girlfriends didn't, didn't uh, give them any sex, why he would, he would provide it for them. And well, <laughs> as a parent, I was absolutely, horrified with my boys ever hanging out somewhere where he could run into this guy because I felt that this guy was very seductive. He was very good looking, charming, funny. And there was just teens that were one, and he'd buy the teens drink, drink alcohol and treat them, you know, just like they were equals. And he was fascinated with them and listened to their, their troubles. And I, I thought that he was probably doing a better job of this than a lot of the parents were doing. Well, you weren't buying your kids any drinks. No, no, I wasn't buying them alcohol. You certainly weren't fooling around sexually. <laughs> no. Well, there are certain parts of the country that you can get your parents to fool around with you sexually. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. Oh, then we have to be worried about the parent. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying that uh, I think sometimes there could be attitudes, attitudes, uh, and I, I'm aware, you know, that I could make, offend people You're by kidding. saying this. You're kidding. <laughs> you offend me. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do on a regular. You, I do offend a, you on a regular basis. On a regular basis, regular basis <laughs> you do that. I'm just not even afraid. <laughs> and I, but I think that if you want to get get somewhere, you have to go back and look and see. Uh, now. Maybe closing the door to dialogue, to more thinking about whether teens are influenced, can be influenced, 